The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. This is Jeremiah Gurney. Born October 17th, 1812, he was an American photographer. He specialized in a type of photography called daguerreotype, where a piece of silver was treated with fumes to make it light sensitive in order to capture an image. This type of photography was the first of its type to become popular because it would only take a few seconds to capture a detailed image. Unfortunately though, developing the image was laborious and that would contribute to its high cost, leading people to spend their life savings on one image. Photography during this time was very much a luxury, and as a result, many politicians and elites had their picture taken, including President Abraham Lincoln. This image in particular was the first ever authenticated image of him, and it was taken in 1846. Unfortunately though, 19 years later, another famous and rare image of him was taken, and it was this one. It's an authenticated photo of Lincoln in his casket, taken by our photographer, Jeremy Gurney. The significance of this photo is that this is the only surviving image of Abraham Lincoln's funeral. And the reason why Jeremy Gurney was in attendance is because he was a famous photographer of that time. Everybody who had the money wanted their picture taken by him because they came out so clear and people believed that they were more beautiful when they were taken by him. And as a result, he was commissioned to take this picture, but soon after, it was lost. Ironically, most of Jeremy's photographs were preserved because they were so special and because they were so rare, but this photo in particular, depicting the most important historical moment of that time, was left in a book that was hidden away in the Illinois State Historical Society Library. This is Rachel Whitier. She was born in Weymouth, Dorset on the 6th of February, 1979. She was the younger of two children born into a middle-class household, and her parents were separated. Her parents' marriage ending left a large mark on her. She would cope with her feelings of living in a broken family with drug use. At the age of 14, she smoked weed and tried ecstasy for the first time. What began as a simple escape turned into a way for her to fit in with other children at her school. Over time, her drug use would progress to harder and harder drugs, and eventually, she developed a heroin addiction. Yet, through all of that, she was a stellar student, and once graduating secondary school, she thought hard about what type of university she wanted to go to. And during that school search, she met her boyfriend, Luke Fitzgerald. He was 24 years old and also a heroin addict and several months into their relationship, they were injecting together, smoking weed together, and drinking together. This would affect her studies. She would call these moments of her drug use slipping up, but in reality, she was throwing her life away, and she was slipping further and further into addiction. And by mid-1998, Rachel's parents noted changes in their daughter's behavior. They said that their daughter began as a pleasant, exuberant, and very outgoing person but then she turned into an irritable, insecure, and unreliable individual. Rachel would sell anything to feed her addiction, but her mother was adamant in telling the public and the press that her daughter never stole to feed her addiction. Drug counseling was the next step. Rachel really needed help, and she attempted to avoid the consumption of drugs for months at a time. And to her parents' delight, in 1999, Rachel decided to clean herself up and reapply to university. She wanted to continue her education in psychology and sociology, and she was on the straight and narrow for a few months before she slipped back into heroin addiction. And in late 1999, she and her boyfriend moved to a different town, rented an apartment, and chose to shoot up all day long. At this point, Rachel was separated from her family. They knew that she was alive, but they didn't quite know what she was doing. While living in this new town, she picked up simple jobs to feed her addiction. So did her boyfriend. And unfortunately, on May 10th, 2000, at the age of 21 years old, her body was discovered by her landlord. 
Her boyfriend had given her too much heroin and she had overdosed on the floor. I chose to censor the image not only because it's a dead body, but because it depicts this woman's lowest moment. She's crouched on the floor, knees tucked to her chest, and her arms are purple, and so is her face. The police officers don't quite know when she died, but they do know how she did and who was responsible. Unfortunately, the boyfriend didn't see any jail time. There wasn't any sufficient evidence of foul play, and he was released without charge. Rachel's story is incredibly tragic. It's a story that's unfortunately becoming more and more common, a story of an individual's life being ruined by drug abuse, and as a result, hers was turned into a 22-minute documentary as a drug awareness campaign. It's called Rachel's Story, and it was released shortly after the images of her body were released to the media. This is nine-year-old Tyshawn Lee. And in November of 2015, something awful happened to him. Dwight Boone Dottie and Corey Morgan were two members of a local street gang. And earlier that year, Corey Morgan's brother was killed and his mother was shot during a shooting in the neighborhood. Corey Morgan and Dwight Dottie found out that the shooting was from a rival gang and they knew that the son of a rival gang member would consistently play basketball in the neighborhood. And on a random day on November of 2015, Dwight and Corey lured Tyshawn into an alleyway with a juice box, and once they were out of sight from the street, Dwight pulled out a pistol, pointed it at Tyshawn's head, and shot him point blank. They then ran down the alleyway, jumped into a getaway car driven by Kevin Edwards, who pleaded guilty almost immediately after all three were caught. After being arrested, the trial was relatively swift. Dwight Dottie received 90 years in prison, plus three years supervision, and Corey Morgan, who was accused of planning the brutal murder, was sentenced to 65 years in prison with three years of supervision. The getaway driver, Kevin Edwards, was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Once the trial was over, Tyshawn's grandmother had something to say to the three monsters who took her grandson's life. You preyed on Tyshawn, you lied to Tyshawn, you lured Tyshawn, and you murdered Tyshawn. You left his little body in a cold alley to die, and you drove off like he was some kind of animal. He was just an innocent little boy. This is the front cover of Madden NFL 19. It's an American football simulator game, and it was available to play on the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. The game, like many others, are multiplayer, and as a result, its competitive scene is pretty large. And the story I'm about to tell you is about one competitive player in particular. His name is David Katz. Known under the username Bread, he was a prolific tournament goer, and many other competitors acknowledged his skill and talent. In one Madden tournament in particular, in 2017, he was interviewed by CNN reporters about him winning that year. And there's a direct quote from him saying during that interview that he thinks he was personally one of the better players in the community. And this is important to note, David Katz wasn't used to losing, and any time he would, he would behave erratically. This was the direct result of his schizophrenia. For the majority of his life, he had been prescribed antipsychotics, but in this case, in 2018, when he lost the tournament, his medicine and subsequent therapy did nothing to curb his malicious behavior. On August 26, 2018, the Madden 19 tournament had begun. It was being hosted in Jacksonville, Florida, and there was around 150 participants. It's unknown how many rounds that David Katz was participating in before he lost, but it's assumed that he didn't matriculate up the bracket enough to even remotely be competitive. And as a result of him losing, he pulled out two handguns from his bag and fired into a crowd of people, shooting 12 and killing two. One of the two victims in particular was another player who was directly responsible for him being knocked out of the competition. Immediately after firing the 12 shots, David Katz quickly picked up the second gun and shot himself. The two victims were named Elijah Clayton and Taylor Robinson. Both were very talented at the game and both unfortunately lost their lives because David Katz couldn't handle losing. Elijah Clayton in particular didn't plan on going to the tournament. It was actually a last minute decision, and there is a photo of Elijah Clayton circulating online immediately after he beat David Katz. It shows there's a red dot laser on his chest moments before he was shot. I don't know how many of you guys in the audience are religious, but to those who are, if you heard the word of God tell you to end your child in the world's worst way, 
would you heed his word? If your God told you to destroy your child, to destroy the one thing that you love more than anything, would you obey their word? If you don't have an answer to that question right now, maybe by the end of this portion of the video, you might. Let me introduce you to this woman. Her name is Dana Schlosser, and on November 22nd, 2004, she heard the word of God. Born in 1969 in upstate New York, Dana Schlosser started out life with a significant handicap. She developed hydrocephaly, or water on the brain, and by the age of eight years old, there was so much cerebral fluid in her brain, it was damaging her cognitive function. She had to go through eight surgeries by the time that she was 13 years old, and even with some cognitive disabilities, she was able to get a psychology degree at Marist College. This is also where she met her husband, John Slosser. After a few years of the couple being together, they decided to move down to Texas, where John Slosser started a business within the computer science industry. And it was relatively successful. John earned enough where Dana didn't have to go to work. She could be a stay-at-home mom. But things weren't good at home. John was a controlling partner. Dana could rarely leave the home. And when she did want to find work for herself, John forbade it. Over time, the couple stumbled upon a fundamentalist church named the Water of Life. It was run by an army veteran turned preacher who said that he spoke to God directly. Over time, Dana became overly involved in the church, potentially as a means of escaping her terrible home life with her husband. And the home life seriously did become worse. John decided to abandon his lucrative computer consulting business and attempt to find more lucrative jobs, but he simply found none. Over time, they had to foreclose on their large home, and they decided to move closer to the church in Plano, Texas. On top of the manipulation from John and the verbal abuse, Dana had miscarried three times, and her mental state was already very tenuous. And in 2003, she tried for a baby one more time. She gave birth to Margaret Schlosser. Unfortunately, Dana had a hard time emotionally connecting with the child. She developed severe postpartum depression. The depression was so debilitating and serious that immediately after Margaret was born, Dana attempted suicide. She would be separated from the child immediately after and sent to a psychiatric ward, but she didn't receive any help there. Immediately after being released, there were noticeable changes in her behavior. Her husband, John Slosser, didn't help her mental state either. What initially began as verbal abuse turned into physical abuse. John would consistently beat Dana with a wooden spoon. The reason for these beatings was because Dana was seeking out psychological help, and this was against the church teachings. So he tried to discourage her behavior by consistently beating her. Over time, the motives for the beatings changed. Dana's mental health declined even more to the point that she wanted to offer up her child to Doyle Davidson, the priest of the Water of Life Church. John obviously disagreed with this and would consistently beat Dana to discourage her from offering her daughter to the priest. Some time passes, more abuse occurs, and the family continues to go to this church. And on November 22nd, 2004, Dana claimed that she saw a news story about a lion mauling a young boy and took it as a sign of impending apocalypse. She then claimed that she heard God's voice command her to cut off Margaret's arms and then her own in tribute. The baby would subsequently be decapitated, her arms and legs would be cut off, and then Dana would unsuccessfully try to cut off her own arms. Covered in blood, she dispassionately called the cops, and with a voice and hem playing in the background, Dana Schlosser confessed to the unthinkable. She told the 911 operator calmly that she had decapitated and dismembered her child with the motive being that God told her to. And after she confessed, she began chanting and singing, thank you Jesus, thank you Lord, over and over and over. The police arrested her and the trial was swift. She was found not guilty by reason of insanity, with the argument being that she was severely mentally ill due to her postpartum depression. After being sent to a Texas psychiatric facility, she befriended Andrea Yates, the Texas woman who murdered five children, and they struck up a friendship. Dana was quoted saying, She is almost my identical personality. I think we'll be friends forever. I've only known her for a short period of time, but I believe the feeling is mutual. She probably thinks the same thing. In 2008, Dana Schlosser was released to an outpatient facility. She was ordered to be on birth control and take her antipsychotic medications, see a therapist, and not to have any unsupervised contact with children. However, she was committed to an inpatient facility in 2010 after neighbors found her wandering around in the early hours of the morning, dazed 
and confused. I'm sure we're all aware of the issue of drug addiction. In this video, we've already talked about it once concerning one young woman, but usually those stories are isolated to the nations that we live in. And I think sometimes many of us forget that drug addiction is a global problem. These next stream of images that you're about to see are from the Associated Press. It's from an article titled, Despair and Poverty Fueled Drug Use in Afghanistan. And I want to go through some of the images with you. The article begins with an explanation as to why these pictures were taken. It was meant to document how men and women attempt to avoid the horrors of war and poverty through the use and abuse of opiates, specifically heroin. This is an image of a man and his dog. He's currently giving heroin to the dog because the dog is addicted just like him. He would inhale the opiate, put it into a bottle, and exhale for the dog. This is an image of a user who OD'd on heroin. He's covered in a linen shawl, and he's buried under a bridge. This bridge is also a home to many other drug users. The article also goes on to say that this person recently died, and that he wanted to die. The man knew that he was overdosing on heroin, and he didn't want any medical support. He simply wanted to be relieved of his addiction. And the following images that you're about to see are of men who are being processed in prison for their drug addiction. Growing opium and processing it into heroin is a crime in Afghanistan, and the way that law enforcement typically handles drug addicts is by placing them all in the same cell, shaving them, and leaving them alone to experience withdrawal symptoms, with the logic being that this is a way of forcing these people to wean themselves off of drugs. Unfortunately, after they spend their sentence in prison, when released, they immediately start smoking opium again. There's really no therapy or rehabilitation happening in these prisons. They simply just arrest them and release them. And even if there were resources to establish some sort of rehabilitation center, drug users in Afghanistan, like drug users in many other parts of the world, have stigma and taboo applied to them. So really no one in government or the community really wants to see these people helped. They just want them to be off the street. Unfortunately, the growth of people being addicted to opium in Afghanistan, more and more people are seeing opium as a way to escape the horrors of war or simply a respite from poverty. These images are simple. They aren't dramatized. They aren't exaggerated. It's just people suffering. And it's ironic that these images show so much human suffering when the people in them are smoking opium to avoid suffering, to just get a moment of relief. I want to end this story with a quote from the article. It talks about a man who goes out every night looking for one person, his brother. It goes on to say, On the hillside I saw a man who was clearly not an addict. In the darkness he wandered among the men, shining a feeble flashlight on each. He was searching for his brother, who had become addicted years ago and left home. He goes from sight to sight through Cabal's netherworld. He's quoted saying, I hope one day I can find him. This is Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. It became independent from Britain in 1948, and for much of its modern history, it's been under military rule. In early 2010, restrictions concerning the government and free elections began cropping up. And in 2015, there was an installation of a new government led by a veteran opposition leader named Aung San Suu Kyi. And as a response to him being elected, the Myanmar military attacked the government, all while expelling nearly half a million Muslims into Bangladesh. The people of Myanmar despise the military government, and they disagree with the fact that they haven't had free elections since their independence. So as a result, civil disobedience and protests grew. And this story is about one protester in particular. Her name is Kalal Sin. Her background is relatively unknown, but what we do know is that in the year 2020, specifically November, she gained the ability to vote for the first time. And she felt that the election that she participated in was corrupt. And as a result, she became more politically active, arriving at more and more public protests and participating and behaving in civil disobedience. In 2021, during the Myanmar coup d'etat, Kalal Sin began to express her support online for the recently arrested civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi, 
and she also showed her support for the ruling National League for Democracy. On March 3rd, 2021, she participated in a protest in Mandalay wearing a black t-shirt emblazoned with everything will be okay. A photograph of her wearing the t-shirt became iconic. The image of her spread everywhere online. She was dubbed the angel because her shirt was so optimistic. It elevated the morale of everyone protesting that day and everyone protesting afterwards. During the protest, she was reported to have broken open a water pipe to allow protesters to wash tear gas from their eyes. And during this event, she even threw a tear gas canister back at the police and encouraged protesters to take cover when live rounds were fired. While she was on the front line of the protest, she was shot dead. Prior to the event, she had made a Facebook post stating her blood type in case she was injured and to wish for her organs to be donated should she die during the protest. Immediately, she became a martyr for everyone protesting for their right to vote and for democracy to be established in their nation. And unfortunately, she wasn't the only one to be killed. During these protests, over 54 people have been killed so far, and she has become a symbol for those lives lost. On March 4th, her funeral was attended by several thousand protesters. And the next day, authorities went to the cemetery where her remains were buried and exhumed her body for autopsy, which added to her martyrdom. This was seen as tacit disrespect and also the efforts of the government to hide what they did. But everybody knew that security officials during that day ended her life, all because she wanted to have a say in government. When I say the term shock website or gore site, What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Live Leak, Best Gore, Encyclopedia Dramatica? There's plenty of sites that will cater to that type of audience, someone who wants to see somebody get dismembered or electrocuted. Unfortunately, for a lot of us, we were exposed to those things before we were even in high school. And this next story is all about one image that is very popular. And unfortunately, the reason why it's so easy to find is because they were reposted on those sites frequently. This is Rina Palenkova, and on November 2015, she killed herself. She placed her neck on a railroad track and let a train run over her. And the image of her body and the aftermath can be easily found on the internet. Reason being is that she is the most notable casualty from something called the Blue Whale Game. Between the years of 2014 and 2015, there was a challenge online called the Blue Whale Challenge, or the Blue Whale Game, where someone would anonymously contact you through WhatsApp, Kick, Skype, whatever, and give you tasks. They would first ask you if you want to play the game, and if you agreed, this person would tell you to perform actions. They would be mundane at first, and then it would turn into gruesome acts, where someone would ask you to carve their name into your arm with a razor, or ask you to kill a small animal. The multitude of actions that would be demanded of you were all terrible, but they all led up to one most gruesome action, ending yourself, killing yourself, suicide. That was the end of the game. And initially this game was relatively unknown, but the casualty count grew because so many articles started sharing the rules of the game, talking about the game, because they were afraid that other teenagers would be interested in participating. Rina Palenkova's story was the most publicized, mostly because of this image of her standing next to the very train that she would ultimately use to end her life. Fortunately, the Blue Whale Challenge died after 2016, after a few arrests were made in Russia of suspects who supposedly encouraged these children to kill themselves, the game ended. People would talk about it. There were multiple channels on YouTube who covered it, but it still holds a legacy because the image of this teenage girl's body is everywhere online. One search and you will find it. And then you'll start to find posts and forums where people made fun of this girl and the way that she killed herself, talking about how her scarf didn't even come off after the train decapitated her. And I wish that was the worst thing that people said in reaction to those photos. It's a shame that what people remember from all of these articles and what people remember from hearing about this game is a teenage girl ending her life and not a warning about how people can be awful online. 
when people talk about the blue whale game, it's, it's consistently followed by immature and ignorant comments about Rivka's life, and unfortunately, how she decided to end it. Rivka's story is a common one. For some reason, it's a trend to share images and videos of people ending their lives online with the fullest intention of gaining some sort of online clout, or spreading some stupid rumor, or simply just making fun of that person. And a lot of these gore sites propagate those photos and videos. This trend didn't start with Rivka. It didn't start with the Blue Whale game. But parts of me wish that it ended with her. That maybe her loss could be a lesson for all of us to treat suicide seriously and not to treat it as a spectacle. This next post was very popular on the r slash morbid reality subreddit, mostly because of its bluntness. It's a series of five images of someone's bedroom. The bedroom belonged to a woman, the poster's brother's girlfriend. She was addicted to opiates, and her addiction was ignored. Her brother was also complicit in her addiction. He was addicted to opiates too. Unfortunately though, she died. She overdosed, and these pictures were taken while the family was clearing out her house. The bed is covered in garbage, in needles, in pill bottles, and trash from band-aids. That in particular was shocking because I didn't even consider it. If you are injecting all the time, you probably need multiple boxes of band-aids. Images like this, their bluntness, their simplicity, just tell a story. It tells a story of a person who desperately needed help who desperately needed care. And since they couldn't find that, since that was absent, they found relief, they found respite in a substance. Whether it be illegal or legal, people are addicted to things because they're trying to run from something. The poster didn't go into detail about this woman's background, what she experienced, what she thought, what she was feeling that would have motivated her to engage in this type of addiction. We can only speculate. And unfortunately, the comments were mixed. A lot of sympathy and a lot of judgment. I want to know what your thoughts are when you see photos like this. If you've had experience with a family member being addicted to drugs or if you've been addicted to drugs, please share your story. Because photos like this lack context and I think that leads to a lot of judgment. That leads to a lot of people being cynical. And I genuinely believe if you're willing to share your story, it's like this woman sharing hers. It adds context for her life. It makes things a little bit more nuanced. I don't think she wanted this for herself. I don't think anybody wants addiction. It's very much something that happens to you. It's hardly purposeful. What's up, everybody? I hope you enjoyed the long-awaited 12th installment of r slash morbid reality. And uh, for those who have been waiting for a long time, I apologize. I really wanted to make sure that this one was completely fleshed out. The previous episodes seemed too short and seemed too brief. And also, doing consistently negative content has absolutely crippled my brain. So sometimes I need to take a little bit of a break from reading stories about people shooting themselves. But I digress. I do this for y'all, and you guys seem to really enjoy. It. Quick updates about the channel. This week there's going to be consistent uploads from Monday to Saturday and I think a little bit through next week. Uh, I have a whole lot of content backlog and since it is winter break, since everything is winding down for the year, I have a whole lot of time for you guys. So I hope you enjoy the next Panda Bomb. And as always, we gotta thank the Patreon supporters that make content like this possible. A big thank you to Big Boy Bailey, Primavera, BMX30, Walinda, Ouija Baby, Cinnamon Sticks, Crush40 Legacy Gamer, Scott, Rivka, Lightstar, Samantha Bellhart, Admin Faneker, Zach F, Darth Titan 44, Keely D, Dunder Has Hawk, Viva LaRue, Knobs, Lady Laughs A Lot, Swiss Patreon user, Noah, and Catherine Taylor. Thank you so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. And if you want to help support the channel, there's two links in the description, one to my merch store and one to my Patreon. Both funds go directly into the channel so we can maintain what's happening here. And as always, stay zesty.